All right, hello everyone. Um, I am uh, uh, Dimitrios Kostopoulos. Uh, I am uh, the co-founder of uh, the Hands-On Organization. Um, and uh, um, tonight uh, we will uh, have a webinar um, discussing on how to fill your clinic and grow your revenues right now uh, with the whole COVID-19 situation. And um, I um, have as co-panelists with me uh, two individuals very dear to me. Um, I have uh, Christina Panetta, uh, who is a very good friend for many years and uh, a, a pioneer in the physical therapy um, arena um, with, uh, a tremendous, um, uh, with tremendous entrepreneurship and great spirit of advancement of the profession. Um, and she has done a lot of things that she will share with us in the success of her practice. Um, I will also have uh, um, uh, Kostas Rizopoulos, who is my business partner, who will be joining us a little bit later on during tonight's presentation because right now, as we are speaking, he is implementing one of the strategies that we will talk about. Um, uh, he is live right now doing one of the things that um, we will discuss tonight. So um, I will start um, by saying that um, what we are facing right now with COVID-19, um, yes, it presents a challenge, but for those who really um, will, who will apply very precisely, um, uh, carefully designed strategies um, and uh, plans um, will really have tremendous opportunities uh, in the marketplace for them. And we will address some of these tonight. The next two slides I will show you represent actually um, a, uh, a, a, a review. I have shown these two slides in the past, uh, but they are so, um, so important and so applicable to what we are going through right now. Um, and here is the slide that there are practices that um, before COVID-19, they were at a specific financial um, area of production. Um, there might be a production in terms of money in a week, in a month, or whatever. And then um, during COVID-19, what happens is that um, they have a significant decrease in those revenues. Some practices, they have completely shut down around the country. Um, and some, and in some states, practices are reopening very, very um, slowly. So, and there are other practices um, that they have a reopening uh, and maybe numbers in the neighborhood of um, even 80%, 85% of pre-COVID numbers, but the dangers of what could potentially happen in the near future are not over. And I am going to talk about some of them right now. So I'm going to address a couple of issues, and I have some of this in summary here. Um, 
first of all, in order for physical therapists in private practice to be busy, to produce, to have revenues, you need to have people, patients, who either can pay you money cash or they have to have jobs with good insurances, which insurances will pay you. I hope that this is understood, that when you have a good and robust economy, then that good and robust economy delivers to you. And good and robust economy is not necessarily only when we see um, 5% or 10% uh, the Dow going up. I mean, not 10%, that would be a bit too much. That would be more than 2,500 points. But let's say when you see 400 points, the Dow going up, or the S&P going 60 points up or 100 points up, um, uh, that is not necessarily a true representation of the marketplace that provides to you as a private practice physical therapist your revenue. You need people who have jobs so that through their jobs can have insurance and good enough insurance to be able to pay you benefits or people to have money where they pay you directly cash for your services. Because sometimes people have only cash-based business. So this is what, what, you, what we really need. And what we have in front of us right now with 30 something million people expected to be reported, about 36 million people from what I understand are expected to be reported as unemployed um, in the numbers that will be coming up out soon. Uh, we're talking about an unemployment rate, most likely in excess of 25%. Leading economists that I was uh, listening to um, actually earlier this morning uh, on Bloomberg TV, um, they were reporting that it can take up to three years for the unemployment rate to return back to about six or seven percent. In other words, the pre COVID 19. Um, uh, times. And this is something that everybody can understand. You, you can understand that very easily because, uh, quite frankly, let me, let me pose this question to you. As a private practice owner, are you going to say, okay, no problem, I'm hiring everybody, I, am, I have plenty of therapists waiting until patients are going to call? or you are going to be more frugal about your hiring patterns. You're gonna to try to cut expenses. Well, and I am not talking about the period of time that you are receiving PPP money and the PPP forgiveness. I'm talking about what happens after that. It is even possible that as, as reported um, uh, earlier today, actually, in uh, uh, a uh, town hall meeting we had with members of the American Physical Therapy Association leadership, um, that it is very possible um, by the mid of June um, that we will have finally voted uh, for a package of a phase four assistance that will include small business assistance. So there might be some more PPP money, for example. But that's not what I'm talking about. A government cannot keep giving PPP money forever and ever. Because these are loans, these are money that are being created out of air. This money is created out of nothing. There is no production to substantiate this money. So this money is being created just to help the economy, but at the same time, it increases tremendously inflation. So at some point, these funds will stop. 
So what do you do at that time? Do you keep hiring people if you are not able to resume the type of services you were providing before COVID-19 at those numbers? There is um, a statistic that was announced by the IFA, that is the International Franchise Association, that predicts that 11 to 17 percent of all small businesses in the United States will not reopen. There is also a projection that 15 percent of restaurants will not be reopening. But what are the numbers for the physical therapy industry? Well, I will share um, with you um, some numbers that um, have been shared um, with us by our very good friend, uh, Bob Kowalik, who has actually um, uh, produced a extensive survey that he looked the finances and the financial projections of over 300 plus private practices across the entire US. So what he did, based on the financials that these practices provided to him, he classified them in four categories. Category one was our practices that even if they did not get PPP money, they would make it. They were strong financially enough that they would make it without PPP money whatsoever. Category number two were practices that they would receive the PPP money and they needed the PPP money. And by getting the PPP money, they would not let go of any employees. Category number three would be practices that they need the PPP money, they would receive it, but still they would have to let go some employees and significantly reduce expenses to be able to make it. And category number four are practices that even with the PPP money, even after letting go of staff, they still can't make it. So it was striking to me to hear the percentages in these categories. And you know what the percentages are? Pretty much with a small standard deviation, spread out evenly. So you have about 25% of private practices that even with the PPP money, they have a hard time to make it. They have a hard time to reopen. And you have then practices that with the PPP money, they are reopening, but then once the PPP money is over, despite the fact that they will go back and fire some of the employees that they have already hired, still they won't be able to meet their obligations and expenses and they will have to shut down. And you know, even if the number 25%, even if it's not 25%, if it is less than half, even if it is 10% of practices in the United States, that is still a huge number of PT practices that are being threatened right now because the incomes they make from physical therapy services, they were not substantial enough to help them survive. Or let me express this better. The profit margins they had, they had even before COVID-19, they were not large enough to help them support their operation. The private practice section of the American Physical Therapy Association, every year, the P2P group, the peer-to-peer -peer group of the PPSAPTA, um, we 
uh, put together all of our numbers and they create a benchmark study across the country and they show different benchmarks, visits, income, uh, profit margins, and so on and so forth. Last years, across the nation, profit margin for all physical therapy practices, even in states that they have the highest reimbursement, it was somewhere between 10 to 12%. Now you can imagine that with a, such a small profit margin of 10 to 12%, the slightest thing that happens can create havoc. And everything that I told you right now in terms of numbers and predictions for closures of practices do not include the expected cut of 8% of Medicare starting January 1st and the 15% Medicare cut when a PTA sees the patients. Those numbers that I gave you do not even include those reductions. So unless something really changes and those reductions do not take place, a lot of practices will be in trouble. Now, practices that are in much better shape, that are financially more stable, they will also have tremendous opportunities around the country to create acquisition opportunities. And even some of you that you may have smaller practices uh, where you have not even thought of the idea of acquiring another private practice. If your finances in your small practice are strong finances and you are at a good position, at a good profit margin, you can acquire other practices soon at very, very attractive rates. And I believe that we are gonna have two different waves, probably three different waves for practice acquisitions. We're gonna have a wave around August and September, and those would be practices that after um, the PPP money, um, were exhausted, they were not able to reopen, so they will be selling. Talking about September, October. I'm talking about a second wave of practices around December and January. Practices where PPP money um, was finished, they managed to survive for a few months, but during the time that they were supposed to have a peak, let's say October, November, December, that peak did not happen. Their um, cash is, is not available now anymore, so they have to sell. And then if finally nothing changes and we have the slashing of Medicare rates on January 1st, then you're looking for a third wave around April, May, June. So there will be some interesting things happening and I'm not here to present it all as gloom and doom. That is not my intention. I continue believing and I continue saying, and, and whenever I talk to people, I always say that the best of our days lie ahead of us when we do the right thing, when we implement the right strategies, when we take advantage of what we have in front of us and really strategically move and create opportunities. So the idea that I've been talking about is that when you recover from COVID-19, when you open your practice, if you have not implemented any strategies, your path to recovery will be either very slow or it's gonna fail. And I said that if you do implement strategies, you can have not only an accelerated path to recovery, but you can surpass your pre-COVID-19 numbers.
And this is what I'm talking about, capitalize in opportunities. Now, I'm gonna show you two more slides that are review of things that I have presented in the past, but we will focus tonight to one of the elements of that, which will be how to fill your practice with new patients and how to um, utilize strategies to grow your revenues right now. Because there is no reason, even if you have reduced number of patients, not to be able to have accelerated growth on revenues. And we'll share with you some of these strategies. For example, I said that in our practice, because of the implementation of both telehealth combined with our application of diagnostic testing, we are expecting a 180% growth within the next six to eight months. This is our expectation. In about six to eight months, we are expecting that we are going to be 100% above the numbers where we were at during, uh, I mean, just before COVID-19. And those specific five mitigation strategies that I have presented in the past, just a quick review, are the following. Cash and liquidity, you have to have cash. And that's why I have said time and time again, no matter if you have the money, get the loans, get the cash advances, get the HHSs, get all that because you need to have cash. I would even dare to say at the 3.75% interest rate, take the SBA loan and put it in the bank for a few months. Three point, you get $100,000. How much is 3.75%? 3, 3 you follow me? There is no pre -penalty pay, uh, 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 penalty for prepayment. Keep it and see, have liquidity to inject it when it's needed. Okay, of course, re reduction of expenses and be smart there. You reduce the expenses, but of course, despite the fact you reduce expenses, you do not reduce your um, expenses for promotion. In our practice, actually, and I don't recommend this for every practice, I don't necessarily recommend this. Uh, we have doubled at this point, almost doubled, almost doubled. I'm not going to say double, but almost doubled our um, budget for promotion. Okay, we're cutting from other areas and we're putting into promotion more than before. Mitigation strategy number three that I had talked about and I keep talking about all the time and, and we'll show you how this can help inject immediate revenue in your practice is the implementation of diagnostic testing, uh, musculoskeletal ultrasound and electromyography. Um, then implementation of telept, telehealth, and conversion of patients to telept. Uh, and, and, and people are asking me, why is that? Telehealth is here to stay, okay? Consider that, that telehealth is uh, like uh, the cell phone, that it was not here at some point and now it's here to stay. Telehealth is here to stay. Uh, I myself, I had a meeting with my primary care physician over, over telehealth the other day. And you know what? At this point, I'll go see her once a year in her office. The other visits that I do, I'll do it with telehealth. It's more convenient. Same thing will happen with physical therapy. It will become more convenient. And we have a whole webinar scheduled. I'm gonna give you the details later on 
to discuss telehealth 102 because what everybody has put right now in their practices is telehealth 101. Okay, let's implement telehealth and let's get um, our therapists to start doing telehealth with the patients uh, over a computer just to get over this um, uh, time of crisis. Well, but that's not the only thing you can do with telehealth. So at that webinar, we're going to talk about telehealth 102. What is the future of telehealth in physical therapy? Because that there is a important future uh, there. Uh, somebody is asking me if they, there will be a replay or a, a copy or a, a, a recording of the presentation because they missed the beginning. The answer is yes. Uh, if you go to www.savephysicaltherapy.com and you go to past webinars, we put all of the webinars uh, there and you'll get a recording. Uh, absolutely, it will be posted there. So uh, back to my presentation. Uh, and finally, you have to be ready to deliver. <laughs> and we'll talk about that. And I'll, I'll, I'll go back and forth a little bit with Christine and with Costas later on about what being ready to deliver means. Okay. Um, so... I would like tonight to cover two things. I would like us to cover how to fill your practice by bringing in the practice your existing patients and what can you do with these existing patients to grow your revenues beyond what you were able to bring in in terms of revenues from the same number of patients before COVID-19. And also, what can you do to fill your clinic right now with new patients? Because let's talk about this. Your existing patients, even if you manage to bring them back, which is fantastic, if you are not bringing new blood right here, right now in your practice, <laughs> sooner or later, you have to discharge those patients, the existing ones. How long are you going to keep them? Without new blood, there is no new added patient value. So you need new patients and you need to expand on the reimbursement and revenue you procure from your existing patients. So those are the two things I would like to discuss tonight. So um, I'm gonna turn it a little bit to Christina and, and the, the thing I would like to ask you, Christina, uh, first uh, is I want us to talk a little bit about strategies that you have implemented in your practice to bring back your existing patients uh, and how successful you have been. Let, let's go through the history of, of, of COVID-19. I know that you have incredible numbers. You are sharing them with me week in, week out. Um, uh, let's share some of the successful strategies you implemented to bring in your existing uh, patients. So what happened, you know, when COVID first happened, you know, we're, we're on Long Island, so obviously we were really affected. Like we, we like went, we just crashed, you know, like at one point we were down to like 33% of our business, which is really rough. And this is pre, um, this is when everybody was just signing up for the payment protection program. So at that point, I had reduced staff for like two weeks. And then we were able to get the loan but we're only at 33%. So I kind of was like, oh my God, like now it's a race. So we brought back everybody. As soon as we got the money, we brought everybody back, but we, we focused everything on 
communication, getting in touch with our patients. Um, I kind of set up a system instead of paying them by the hour, I wanted to pay them for 40 hours, but instead of just saying like, we'll come and sit in an office where there's like no patients, I said, let's make sure that every minute you're doing something that helps to fill up our office or do telehealth. So like in the middle of all of that, it was like, okay, we have to learn how to do telehealth. We, we're manual therapy practice. We're like, sounds great, but we don't know how to do it. So that was like the first thing that we did. We bought a course. So we did spend money because it's like we had to teach everybody how to do telehealth. So during that time, we, we taught ourselves how to do telehealth so that we could do it and feel confident that we could do it. Um, for the therapists, I kind of went where I said, let's, let's be more like attorneys and let's do billable hours. So what's a billable hour? Okay, well, if you treat two patients, that's a billable hour in the office because there were some people willing to come into the office. If you do two telehealth visits, 30 minutes each, that's a billable hour. And then in our state, we have workers' compensation and no fault. You can do these little check-ins. So I said, okay, it's only like $35 or something like that. That's four, you know, do four of them and that's a billable hour. And then it's like, okay, well, what else can we do? You know, well, we can call our patients. So we started calling any, any person that had suspended care and we were calling them to either bring them into the office or put them on telehealth. Um, then we started calling any evaluations that never arrived. Then we started calling um, all the patients that we had discharged one year earlier. So I was just like, and I kind of said, I don't know, we just made up numbers. I was like, eight good conversations. If you do eight good conversations, and I just knew that no matter what, even if the, and I said to them, it, I don't even care if they come in, but it's like, we need to be in communication with people. We need to find out do they need food? Do they have COVID? Is somebody in their family sick? Are they, you know, what can we do to help these people? Um, I gave, I told everybody two hours of volunteer work, go work at a food bank, drop off food, um, and then marketing. And so like you, Demi, I, I put more money to marketing. You know, we started, you know, we, we already do um, the workshops where we went virtual. So we had to learn and, you know, we went through everything. It wasn't that it was easy. I probably worked, and the whole staff has worked harder than ever in their lives, ever. Like, if you could hear us before these kinds of calls, the half an hour before, if that was recorded, it wasn't pretty. It was like, we were, you know, it was terrifying. And we would have all kinds of crazy technological issues. But, like, I feel like we need, like, everybody just, it was like, it was almost like um, being, like, in a, disaster zone or something like it was like everybody was just like okay i'll do it you know we took front desk people that we didn't need doing front desk because bob kowalczyk said get on the phone and do collections and i put them in the collections department and we we moved everybody around just to like do the work that needed to be done and i really and i i felt like the whole time like we're in week five so i only have three weeks left of the payment protection money so you know, I've been having this analogy that, you know, guys, we're climbing Mount Everest. We, you know, 33%, we're not even at base camp. You know, so when we like hit 50%, we were like, oh my God, like we're at base camp, you know, and let's climb above. And, you know, so we've been every week, like just talking to everybody. And a lot of like what I'm doing is just like cheering them on and looking for any marketing, um, any marketing thing that like we could literally like do like like the big problem is like our doctors they only started working this week like patients like they're not even they weren't even open half of them weren't doing telehealth so you know being the fact that we do do diagnostics that became like so important because people could come straight to us so then we had to start advertising that like and and we didn't know how to do a lot of this stuff so you know we had to find people who could help us like get out there and market it and say, all right, if you're having shoulder pain, you know, we can, we can look at that. You, you can't even get an MRI or go to an orthopedic, but we can help you with that. And so the whole team, like just every week, like building on that, like our races, our target is that we want to be at a hundred percent by the time our money, like the PPP money runs out, because then all we have is that, you know, maybe we have a bridge 
where we won't quite have enough money, but we have, you know, we have that money from reserves. So that's what, that's what we've been doing. I mean, it's definitely wasn't easy, but the, but the team, like, I feel like they have the energy now to see that what they're doing and that they can learn new things and it works. And, and definitely um, agree so much with you uh, in terms of um, inspiring the team and, and, and help them to really um, work for it <laughs> and, right. and feel that they are creating. Um, you see, I believe that what happened now with COVID-19, the level of necessity increased for everybody. Mm -hmm. um, and I, and I want to make sure that everybody speaks the same language. When I'm talking about level of necessity is um, what level of necessity, I, I define it as the higher or lower degree of actions that someone has to engage in to promote survival. That is my definition of level of necessity. So uh, when everything is hoki-dory, the level of necessity is okay. But when you don't have a job, or when you, your statistics of patients crash and all of a sudden you are seeing from, I don't know, from 100 patients now you see 10, from uh, so many new patients per week, all of a sudden you had none, <laughs> then your level of necessity increases because unless you do something, you are not going to survive. So the, when the level of necessity increases like this, you are able among your staff also to distinguish those who are the real players who are worthwhile for you maintain and investing in them in the long run uh, compared to others that they may not take it. Um, and I know that in your situation, well, I'm not going to say, and I know that in some situations that I, I, I've spoken to people, there might have been one or two therapies, even therapies where they said, oh, you know what? I'm okay with my unemployment. I'm not coming back. Mm -hmm. I'm not coming back. And they feel comfortable because just collecting unemployment, they, because they are able to see just up to there. They cannot see the future, right? And they think that there's not going to be unemployment for PTs, that they'll be able to maintain the same nice salary um, in the months to come. That's not necessarily truth. When NYU Langone is losing $400 million a month, $400 million loss per month, that's, that's very important. I don't know how many people will be able to maintain jobs like that. But I'm going to share, and I'll go back to Christina in a moment. I'm going to share a couple of things. But this very first thing that I have here, it's so important. I'm talking about perception about safety. So, and I'm asking you this question, okay? I don't care if you, are, you live in a, in a state that still has um, a, a, a stay home order or you, you're in a state where you, you can go to a, a restaurant. Like today, uh, you were able to start going to restaurants in Ohio, for example. Okay. Uh, let me ask you, either right now or in the near future where you're going to be going to a restaurant, are you going to go? to a restaurant where the one table is on top of the other where you a bunch elbows, you bump elbows with the person next to you, or you're gonna go to a restaurant where the tables are larger, where there is enough space between tables, where that restaurant uh, owner he has invested to have all of the utensils packaged inside sterilized packaging. Or you're going to go to a restaurant where they show that there is no difference between pre-COVID to now. Are you going to fly with the airline that packs the planes 
with one, at 100% capacity or with the airline that leaves the middle seat open. You see, you gotta think of that. So you're gonna tell me now that, yeah, we have done all that. We have put in our practices all the safety, CDC, and, um, and OSHA precautions and regulations. Well, I know you have done it. If you have done it, then you know you have done it. But here is my question. Do your patients know that you have done it? Do they know? Because if they don't know, they are your consumers. So the number one thing that you should be doing is creating precautions in your space, creating the OSHA and uh, CDC regulations, but at the same time, show it to patients. Um, in our website, this is our, our hands-on website, and I don't know if, Christina, you have something similar, uh, uh, you, can, you can share it too. In our hands-on website, if you scroll down, we have a video and we're promoting that, this video in social media. This video is showing a lot about precautions. And of course, it talks about telehealth and all that, but it talks about um, safety precautions. Um, I'm not ready yet to show you everything that we are implementing in, in our office uh, but it will be ready on the 29th of May. What is that? I'll give you a little description, as descriptive as I can be. When someone walks in, there will be, there are right now, only four chairs in the entire waiting area with tremendous social distancing between chairs. In our front desk area, we already have clear panels, clear plexiglass panels, where the secretaries are behind these panels. And the patients, they have to touch very little or nothing to get their intake in the office. Maybe they have to touch a, uh, a, 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 an iPad uh, with a glove that is provided to them. Then, right as they enter the practice, on the floor of the practice, yellow arrows that show the flow, the path that patients will go through, going through one way, coming out a different way, so that patients who enter and exit, they don't bump with each other, let's say, in a corridor. We have created, I mean, we had those spaces, but other practices can create them right now. Create private treatment areas for the patients. I don't care if there are walls. I mean, in our cases, yes, we have private rooms. We have walls and everything where the patient will be just with a therapist and nobody else around there. But if that is not available, put dividers, buy inexpensive dividers and create that environment of safety for the patients. It's all about perception, guys. There is essence to it, there is the essential part, but there is also the perception, the perceived safety. Patient after they receive their treatment, of course, using always disposable electrodes and all that, they go into the gym. And that is where we have purchased uh, from Amazon. That's why it takes a little longer to get those. That's why I cannot show those to you. These large, clear plexiglass panels, they are expensive. They go $950 each. But you put those panels in between your treadmills or in between your exercise equipment. And while the patient, they are inside the gym, and they can see the whole space, they feel very protected because they are not, although they can see the patient next to them, 
there is a physical but aesthetically pleasant barrier between themselves and the patient next to them, which by the way, that barrier is being sanitized by the technicians in between patients while the patients visibly can see the sanitization. And then patient exits from the practice. So like these things are so important on how you present them and how the patients can see them. And in those of you who may have pediatric practices, I would say how the parents can see these things and get a, 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 an appreciation of, um, of the safety precautions. Um, uh, as a matter of fact, what I told you about the 29th is that on the 29th, we're gonna be creating a new video and the only purpose of the new video is to demonstrate the patient's experience from the moment they walk in until the moment they walk out. And it will be solely based on, um, uh, on safety. Because I'll tell you, quality care, fantastic. We do quality care, Christina does quality care, Kara and Cindy and David and Dimitri and Pauline and Alton uh, and Howard who are uh, out there uh, as participants in this uh, webinar. We all do quality work. The, the thing is, what do you do that will set you apart from the competition and at the same time set you apart to the level of the patient feeling comfortable to visit you? Um, so, uh, I don't know, Christina, if, if you have a comment uh, about, about this. I took a lot of notes, but, <laughs> you know, we're, we're absolutely, you know, we're doing all those things. And even our little videos, like, because one of the things we have all the staff doing is, you know, we work with GrowthX and they gave us a marketing calendar. So we're trying to do the videos, but make sure, you know, we have masks on and gloves on. And I did a little video, um, Karen was doing an ultrasound and the patient had a mask on, Karen had a mask on she had gloves on so yeah like I, I wrote down all the things you're doing we can like I, I agree like we're doing all those things I know we're 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 burning through gloves like crazy like and, and I bring in every week I, I'm like chins like I make sure that because I don't want them to disappear so I bring in hundreds of gloves and then they're like we're out of gloves I'm like oh my god what do you mean you know we need like 800 more gloves this week and crazy and 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 and, and, and the, the other thing I wanted to uh, mention is that um, communicate and you said that before communicate with the patients uh, talk to them in a way that makes them feel comfortable to come back to the practice and please do not take for granted and make the assumption that your staff members know how to talk to the patients. Well, I don't know if you are the best person who knows how to talk to the patient. Maybe you are, but maybe another staff member that you have has the most success. Find <laughs> the most successful person talking to the patients on the phone to get them back, to recover them as a callback program and have that staff member identify specifically what that staff member tells the patients and have that staff member train the rest and give to your staff a script. In our practice, from the moment that we had no script, and I did a training, Costas did a training, we did a training to our staff, like Zoom training, how to talk to the patients and da, 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 but with no script. Well, guess what? The moment we gave them an actual script, our numbers went up. Our callback program, our recoveries went up, both for the telehealth product and to the in-office therapy product. So I totally recommend that you create a successful script and you give it to your patients. 
But Christina, I want to jump on right now to discuss about new patients. Because yes, you bring in your existing patients, but without new blood, can do much, anything. So we need new, plan, new blood. Uh, what have been the successful strategies that you have implemented um, uh, to bring in new patients, new blood in your practice? And how successful have you been? Well, the two, the two biggest things that we did was bringing in new patients from our patients that had been discharged and had um, suspended their programs. That was the first thing. But then that sort of, you know, you, you hit your numbers there. So the other thing is we always did in-person workshops with GrowthX. And we did that through um, ad spend, through Facebook. So we transitioned to where now every single week we basically do a what we call a virtual workshop. So it's every, you know, we do shoulder, knee, uh, lower back. So we kind of alternate those things. And we basically every single week we do a workshop because our physicians, we, when they're not around, you know, I mean, they're, they're only starting to work this week. So one of the plus points that I think has come out of this is that we, like this week, we brought in 85% of what we consider an average number of referrals. Last week, I think we were at about 70%. So we have, what we're seeing is, and the cool thing is, we're doing it direct from the public. So basically, we're doing our workshops every single week, very consistently. And we're doing that with the, you know, with GrowthX through that program. And then we're doing, we implemented their marketing calendar. So every single day where we have some kind of marketing that's going out on Facebook and we, we increased and we're doing direct to the public marketing, every single office. Oh, the other really big thing that we did is we started contacting um, organizations. So you could take like Orange Theory or um, a mom's group or a church group and so what we're doing is we do, we do the workshops through the, you know, we do the same virtual workshops, but we do them with groups. So then they send out the email to their group. And, you know, we're, we're basically trying to do as many of those as possible. So basically all of our marketing has been direct to the public. We did the PT for Heroes. So like Therese, um, she volunteers with the ambulance. You know, we didn't just, posted on our Facebook, she went to the ambulance. I mean, she volunteers there, so that's fairly easy. But then she started thinking about like Northwell, right, in Bayshore. And she's like, I know people, you know, she knows the, the, the staff that works there. So it's like, it's not enough to just put it on your website and, and you know, nobody's going to go and be like, oh, you know, I need physical therapy. But people are in pain. So it's kind of like you have to meet them where they're at. And that's basically what we've been doing to drive in our patients. They're all either our past patients or they're new public that have pain through the advertising. And we did increase our dollars. Like we just started putting more money towards that because I personally feel like the only way we're gonna get out of where we are and back to where we were is new patients. So our focus has been new patients. Christina, tell me a little bit about um, the campaign that you just started literally telling people about MSK ultrasound and, and the results that you have gotten from this campaign, like literally overnight. So that, that's been our, that's been an amazing campaign. So we had this idea that, I mean, here's the other thing I li I have, this is, let me think, I think I've heard you go through the five mitigation steps. I mean, like the other thing I've done is I'm in like every group that there is. So I, every day I'm learning something. I'm on a webinar. I'm going like, What's new? What's out there? So I, I have heard the five mitigation steps. I could probably give the, the lecture at this point. But the one thing that you talked a lot about was, and even Bob Kowalczyk talked about, is that we have to improve our average reimbursement. It stinks in New York. It's, you know, if you're, you're, all you can do in New York is treat more patients. So that's a problem. So the only thing you can do is look at like, well, what are some services that are valuable that reimburse at a higher rate? So I'm lucky in that I found HODS, the diagnostic company. I signed up to do electrodiagnostic testing and we learned how to do musculoskeletal ultrasound prior to the 
pandemic. So it isn't like we had to learn that. We already know how to do that. But same thing, necessity level, you know? So, so I was like, wow, we really, we really I don't want to run out of cash. So I started looking and saying like, well, how do we make a patient more valuable? And who do we want to see? So what do we love? We love shoulders. Oh my gosh, we love shoulders. My therapists love shoulders. They, they're motivated. They want to get better. So we're doing shoulder workshops. And then the other thing was, I was like, well, anytime we have a shoulder patient, we can do a musculoskeletal ultrasound. And the fact that they can't go see their orthopedic doctor and they can't get an MRI right now, how valuable is what we do? So we started advertising that you can, do you have shoulder pain? You know, um, have you always wished somebody could just look inside your shoulder? Like very simple stuff to the public. Hey, we have a machine. It's the same machine that's used out on the battlefield, you know? We're giving away 19 coupons. <laughs> so 25 people on my schedule since last Monday, not this Monday, the Monday before. It's probably more. That was my number a few days ago, but it's, and so what do I have? I got therapists that are happy as can be. I got patients that are like, wait, you can look at my shoulder. I can, it's, it's unbelievable. So for us, that sort of opened up my mind. And then I was like, well, why am I not doing this with the electrodiagnostic testing? Like, why don't I start, like, like what, I, what I found was I'm like, you can go after what you want in your practice. So if you want diabetic neuropathy patients, or if you're a really great uh, manual therapist and you want more lower back patients, well, we can figure out like what's going on. Do they have a compressed nerve? Is there any nerve damage from that? Or, you know what I'm saying? And so now that patient, think about it. If they're going to come in for like, what's an average patient worth? Let's say they're worth a thousand dollars for PT. But if I can add an, a, an EMG, that patient is now worth 15 or $1,600 because now I'm doing an EMG with that patient. If I do an ultrasound, which takes me 15 minutes, it doesn't take a long time. I'm adding in my practice 150 extra dollars, right? So I just started looking and saying like, why we weren't really taking as good advantage of using the diagnostic testing to drive in patients that want to know more about their condition. So now I'm like, well, let me just drive in the people that are more valuable to the practice because right now I got a little bit, I got, I have a bridge, you know, I have to, I, when my money runs out, I won't, you know, like if I get up to 100%, my money in June is going to be based on when my numbers were at 60%. So I'm going to be a little, I'm going to be a little off. So I need to make sure that my, the cash that's coming in is better. So does that answer the question? Yeah, uh, uh, that, that, that's awesome. And, and, and definitely um, it, it creates the implementation of diagnostics it creates a, um, a, a tremendous um, uh, improvement in your numbers because you are simply bringing um, significant additional revenue in your practice just from implementing uh, diagnostic testing. But if this strategy was a phenomenal strategy for the past, now this strategy is a strategy of necessity because just imagine that even if you had um, only 50% of your patients returning or 60% of the, your patients returning, you do not need to do too much marketing for the diagnostic component the moment you uh, can implement the diagnostics, which will increase your per visit reimbursement for each of these patients. But what Christina is doing, and actually my business partner Costas, what is doing right now, he's doing a workshop. Okay. Mm -hmm. Right now, as we are speaking and, and he's, he was supposed to be here already, but uh, uh, he's doing a workshop. Okay. So they had like 30 something people um, that he started speaking to through a workshop. 
During the workshop, he starts talking to them online like this about uh, the shoulder. It's a, it's a rotator cuff workshop. And then he starts telling people um, if they would like to see inside the shoulder. So he shows them inside the shoulder through the musculoskeletal ultrasound and they can understand it, they can make sense. And he makes an offer to them that whoever would like to, for me to show you inside your shoulder, as Christina said, I have these 20 free coupons, whoever will make that appointment first. And people will show up. So the schedule fills. You will charge the insurance company. You are going to get paid for the visit. And you have a new physical therapy patient where the overall reimbursement now of that and the patient value is significantly greater because of you did the EMG or you did the ultrasound. Um, somebody asked me the question here, uh, how much is an EMG and an ultrasound machine? There are the different costs to that. I mean, we recommend you machines to get. We don't really dictate to you what you're going to get. But literally, if you list uh, an EMG uh, and an ultrasound machine, each of them, the leases are for about $400. Um, so with very little money, um, literally with one test, an e one EMG test per month can pay for the machine or, or you know two ultrasounds per month will pay for the ultrasound machine uh, because the reimbursement is much higher and this is something that you can implement right now for your practice since um, hands-on diagnostics we are having the COVID-19 promotion where you can start this just with $5,000 and you can start receiving all this training and start making money with an initial, um, with an initial payment of uh, a fraction of what it is uh, required. Um, and uh, having the ability to do that and having the ability to use um, HHS funds um, or EIDL funds since you cannot use EIDL funds and HHS funds for, your, for other things, for your payroll or for your PPP stuff, right? Because it cannot be the same. Uh, very easily you can use uh, funds that you got through EIDL or HHS to start doing this. And um, some people are asking, uh, no, you do not need to make new insurance contracts. You are using the same contracts you have. In some cases, it might make sense um, to do some new contracts, but um, uh, you know, you don't, it's not a mandatory requirement. Um, and uh, uh, how you're going to get the training? We are implementing right now a uh, tremendous technology where um, you are doing the training live online. So with the faculty, with the mentor on the computer and you on the other side uh, with uh, two different phones and the camera of the phones and you do the whole training and practice. I mean, we did a couple of them just recently. Christina's staff were there participating and uh, it was um, very, very good. Um, any other questions that uh, you guys might have uh, for us? Uh, tonight we'll be able to uh, answer. Um, but uh, if you want to know more about how uh, hands-on diagnostics can help you implement this in your practice in an immediate basis and start really um, earning additional dollars from your existing patients, go to hadsmeeting.com and just book a meeting uh, with us and uh, we'll be able to, uh, to help you um and um, uh, guide you through the process and help you really uh, establish this uh, in your practice any questions from anyone 
Um, Christina, I just wanted to um, ask you uh, this. Uh, how do you see the role of diagnostics for the future of the physical therapy profession? And, and, and furthermore, how do you view in general the future of the profession? Well, in terms of diagnostics, you know, I, I have second generation in the practice. So when we started doing diagnostics, personally, I was like, I think that I, she had only been out of school a couple of years. I, I was like, this is, I, personally, I think it is the future. I think it, it opens up, it broadens our, you know, skill base. It lends itself perfectly to the direct to the public. And the biggest thing that I've learned through the pandemic is we can be, we can drive in patients direct from the public that have pain and need help and are looking for help in natural ways without unnecessary medications, injections, and surgeries. Despite all of the educating. I'm educating for 30 years and I'm not like, and I've made big changes with our referral base, but it is still common for people when they go to an urgent care or to a physician to be given medication first, even though there's so many documents that say, try physical therapy first. So the cool thing is with diagnostics and with our ability to go direct to the public, so many new ways to do that, patients want help and they want it naturally. So we can bring them in. What I see is that I think eventually, I think it's gonna be part of the physical therapy curriculum. I think that all physical therapists, you know, maybe not this year or next year, but down the road, all physical therapists will be confident and learn how to do diagnostic testing, it'll just be part of what we do. Like, and that's probably the biggest thing I've learned through the pandemic is that I actually don't need referrals from physicians. And so what's been happening is as we're bringing in patients, we do our testing and then we're making the decision going, you know what, I need to know more about this. So, you know, we had a patient that we did an EMG on and then it was, it, you know, it was, it felt like, she, I needed more information when my daughter did the test. So she then sought out a neurologist. She called the neurologist and said, I'm going to send this patient to you. Here's the reason. Here's the test that I did. And now that doctor, he didn't even know that we did diagnostic testing, but he was extremely impressed. And he, he like then it became like a much more equal relationship where we referred the patient to the neurologist. The same thing with when you start to get a, 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 a person with a musculoskeletal problem and you, you do the ultrasound, you do a treatment. I mean, we have found in, in people, we have found tumors. We have, I mean, we have found serious things that were, they had been seen doctors, they were missed. When you find those things and then you're like, wow, this is like, I am not even, this is different, you know? And you help those patients, one, you recognize that we do have the competency and the skills. We take more time with our patients. They're not just getting an ultrasound by a tech. It is a, this is a doctor of physical therapy that's doing this. And now we're making the referral for that patient. We're directing that patient to, okay, you know, I think this patient, you know, their carpal tunnel, they actually think that they do need to have surgery. You know, so now I'm going to call that doctor up and say, I've been working with this patient. This is what I found, but I kind of, can you take a look at this patient? So I, I see the future. I, I think that all physical therapists eventually, there's going to be the great divide, those that do diagnostic testing and those that don't. And I think that if we really want to take our profession to the level that we want to take it to, we all should be doing diagnostic testing. Uh, thank you, Christina. I, I, I'm going to comment as I'm going to launch a quick poll. Uh, I just want people to um, answer this. Um, it, it, at the end of the day, um, you are doing a marketing campaign, let's say, um, and uh, somebody else is doing a marketing campaign, a competitor uh, next to you. 
at the end of the day, you're the one who is driving through your diagnostic testing promotion the 25 new, five new patients in a matter of a couple of days. The other person is not, uh, just because um, you have a market advantage. That is what you have. You have a market advantage um, uh, compared to the other therapies, the, your competition, uh, you know, and that's, that's uh, uh, very, very uh, important. So um, thank you um, uh, everyone uh, for uh, joining me and Christina tonight. Um, uh, Costas is probably still delivering there on the other. Uh, answering a, he's answering a lot of questions. <laughs> which is good because, you know, the longer these things go, the more uh, people engage and they, and they book uh, appointments. So that's really great. Um, uh, thank you all very much. Uh, reminders for you. Uh, we have our uh, Telehealth 102 um, a webinar, which you are going to be receiving information about. That's next week. Um, you uh, have every Thursday at 1 p.m. Um, the uh, um, town hall meeting. And if you go to www.savephysicaltherapy.com, you can find registration for all of these webinars. Uh, you can find past webinars and you can find resources, okay, about everything. You can find the PPP application calculators for the forgiveness. You can find all that stuff. So anyway, um, hope to see you guys again uh, in the near future. And Christina, thank you for everything that uh, you do and, and we'll chat uh, very shortly. <laughs> And thank you, thank you, Jimmy. You know, like, honestly, you're a true visionary. You've expanded, you know, just what we can be as physical therapists. We, we would never would have seen it without you, and we appreciate it. Oh, boy. So thank you. Okay, thank you, too. All right, guys, have a good night, everyone, and uh, see you all soon. Bye-bye.